quasi-scientific, they're not pseudo, it's quasi-scientific. And this comes from the world of ethnomusicology. And the musicologists back in the early 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century, they made up a system of classifying musical instruments around the world that was almost like you would classify plants or animals. And it had a, you know, or, or like books in a Dewey Decimal System. And so the banjo has an actual number attached to it in this Hornbossel sax. Those are the two guys, two German ethnomusicologists. And in, in, right, around the, right, right around when World War I broke out, these guys unleashed this classification system. And so the, the banjo, I'll come back to this later, but the banjo designation is 321.312. And usually the banjo is 0.5. And you'll see down here, I, 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 I classify the Nemus banjo as 0.6 because it's played with a plectrum with a pick. 0.5 is the banjos that are picked with their pluck with the fingers. But the Nemus banjo, as far as I can see, is always played with a pick. And so I, I put 0.6 on it. But you can, I mean, you can see that's a very quasi-scientific and, I mean, to some extent, alienating designation for this uh, instrument. And, and by the way, in the ethnomusicology world, it's called a spike box lute. There's a larger family of instruments like the banjo. Spike box lute. Now, here's a very different conception of the banjo, and this comes from a book that I'll, I'll show you the cover of later on in a future slide, but it's a book called Well of Souls, Uncovering the Banjo's Hidden History, a very recent publication by a woman named Christina Gaddy. And she said she, she is looking at uh, I mean, really old-time banjos going back to the, the 1600s and the 1700s and the 1800s. And she looks at the history all the way up to the point where we start to see what looks like a modern banjo, the kind that's a, a round wooden hoop or a round metal hoop with five strings, She's dealing with everything before that. And she was looking at three, three banjos, one, uh, one from South Carolina, one from Suriname, and one from Haiti. And she says, the construction of all three instruments is fundamentally the same. They all form a cosmogram, the intersection of the earthly and the spiritual planes. On all, the side of the fruit was a calabash, when she says fruit was a gourd made out of a calabash. The side of the fruit is cut off and covered with skin, and the neck enters and bisects the fruit. Like drums, they are instruments that conjure spirits, and with their construction, might have been able to hold spirits, too. All three instruments are banjos. All three are wells of soul. Wells, wells of souls. So I love that. I love that definition of the banjo because it recognizes the banjo uh, as, as a ritual object, the sacred object, almost like a means of communicating with the, uh, with the ancestors, with the spirit world at the very least, and, uh, and it takes a cultural point of view on the instrument rather than this quasi-scientific description of the, you know, the attributes of the instrument. This is a very nice description of the cultural meaning of the instrument. So I like, those, I, I like to start with those two definitions. So first, uh, to talk about the history of the banjo, we need to look at the African precursors. And uh, by the way, uh, you'll see my email at the end. So anybody that wants to get this PowerPoint deck, I'm happy to share it with anybody. So you can email me and I'll send you the slides. Take pictures if you want along the way, but I'll send you the slides. Uh, there's three instruments that you can see. They look kind of like a banjo. Uh, the the gurmi is from Nigeria. It's from Hausa Land in Nigeria. The Akanting is from the Senegal or Gambia, the Senegambia region, and the Gambusi is from Tanzania, and maybe in Kenya also, it's from East Africa. And uh, this one is, uh, really goes, goes back to Yemen. There's another instrument that's very similar from Yemen. Uh, but this is the one that most people say is the most uh, similar to the banjo. It's like the closest ancestor to the banjo. And you can see that, the, that the, the, the neck or the handle goes all the way through and comes out the other side of the resonator, the round part. <clears throat> Three strings. Um, the thing that's really interesting and different about this is that the handle is, is round. It's like a dowel. It's not flat. And our, the banjos that we know in this uh, part of the world, the neck or the handle is flat. But the banjos, you, 
can't find a banjo in Africa. You only find banjos in, in, the, in, in, in this part of the hemisphere. In this hemisphere, it's really beginning in the Caribbean and then from here migrating to North America. But it started in the Caribbean. And, uh, <coughs> and so by the time the, and the, 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 the history is, is hard to document because you know, who was taking notes of what was happening among the enslaved people? Some oral history there, and there's some, you know, some some uh, some craft knowledge about how to make the instruments. But as far as drawing pictures and writing about it, that's always coming from the European travelers, and they're kind of like an enemy, uh, you know, an enemy audience. But you know, we have records, and and it's worth looking at them. So by the time the first, this is the first drawing, the first mention of the banjo, the first drawing of a banjo, it's 1707, and it's by a guy called Hans Sloan, and he was in, uh, traveling in Jamaica, really. He's based in Jamaica, so what you're seeing there was uh, things that we saw when he was in Jamaica. And while he published in 1707, he was there in the 1680s. He's an interesting guy. Uh, uh, <coughs> I don't really necessarily co-sign on all of his uh, tactics of collecting these things and bringing them back, but the fact is, and they were called uh, curiosities, and he was uh, was one of the first curators, if you think of that word, curate, curators curate curiosities, and all of his collections uh, ended up being the basis of the British Museum. So you will you will find his stuff in the British Museum. He kind of founded the British Museum, and. Uh, that's the first depiction of a banjo, 1707. He called it strum stumps. That was his word for the banjo. He didn't know, he didn't know any other word. Now, 1764, this is a literary reference. I have to read this. There are, this is, this is from a, a book of, it's a long book uh, called The Sugar Cane by a guy called James Granger. He was, from, he was from East Scotland, but he married a woman whose father owned a plantation in St. Kitts, and he became uh, the manager of the plantation in St. Kitts. And he wrote this book, which is in four, or it's an epic poem in four books called The Sugar Cane. And 12 lines of it in book four talk about the uh, enslaved population's music and dance. I got to read these lines to you. He says, uh, 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 and, and, you know, this is, this is old writing where the, the S's look like F's, so, we'll see. Who? What did you say? The F? Yeah, the S's. Some of the S's look like F's. So that first word here that says, this is actually festal, on festal days, or when their work is done, permit thy slaves to lead the choral dance to the wild Banshaw's melancholy sound. Banshaw is the, is the word. That's what we know as banjo. Banshaw's melancholy sound. And look, there's a footnote. This is a sort of rude guitar invented by the Negroes. It produces a wild, pleasing, melancholy sound. Responsive to the sound, head, feet, and frame move awkwardly, harmonious, hand in hand, now locked. The gay troop circular wheels, circularly wheels. He's describing ring dance. And, sh and shrieks, no, sorry, and frisks and capers with intemperate joy. Halts the vast circle, all clap hands and sing. While those distinguished for their heels and air bound in the center and fantastic twine. Meanwhile, some stripling from the coral ring trips forth and not ungallantly bestows on her who nimblest hath the green sward beat and whose flushed beauties have enthralled his soul, a silver token of his fond applause. Anon, they form in ranks, nor inexpert, a thousand tuneful intricacies weave, shaking their feeble, sorry, shaking their sable limbs, and oft a kiss steal from their partners, who with neck reclined and semblant scorn resent the ravished bliss, but let not thou the drum their mirth inspire, nor vinous spirits, in other words, wine, fruit of the vine, vinous spirits, else to madness, uh, to madness, sire, what will, what will not Bacchanalian frenzy dare, 
Okay. <coughs> Fell acts of blood and vengeance they pursued. Now, that is a good example to me of a toxic emission from a, a, a planter who is not in sympathy with the, with the people that are making the music and doing the dance, but at the same time, it gives us an image of, I mean, a word for the banjo, and it gives us an image of the, the ring dance, and, I, you know, and it's from St. Kitts, 1764. 1777, this is uh, something called a Crail Banya. Banya looks like banjo. You can see how that is related. And it's from Suriname. It was collected by a guy called John Gabriel Stedman. He's also an interesting uh, collector and writer. 1785, there was a guy called John Rose who was a plantation owner and a painter. And he painted a watercolor called The Old Plantation. And uh, now we see a gourd, you know, another gourd banjo. These are the ones that Christina Gaddy was comparing to each other. And we can zoom in on the banjo and you can see it's starting to look like something. And there's a gourd and uh, the neck connects to it and it has four strings. It's also a pretty good painting in my view. The way the, you know, you can see the inside of the bottle rising up there and you can see the bones, the, the bones on the guy's leg. Amazing, I think it's an amazing painting. There's the cover of Christina Gaddy's book, and there she is showing you on the cover an example of a bonzo, which is what it was called in Haiti, collected by a guy called Victor Chaucher, who is uh, an educator and considered the French, the, 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 he's considered the father of uh, emancipation in the Francophone Caribbean. There's a whole, that's a whole long, complicated discussion because, of course, there was emancipation in the 1790s and then Napoleon revoked it. And they had to get the second emancipation in 1848. Victor Chaucher was, was one of the main advocates for that, but he toured around the region. He was based in Martinique, but he toured around the region, went to Haiti, collected his banjo or bonza, as he called it. All of these, I'm, I'm sort of grouping them together as gourd banjos, where there's a calabash that is the resonator, and um, after, I mean, after, eight, after this point in 1840, you have a very different kind of banjo emerging. And it really started because of the minstrel show in the United States, which began in the 1820s and 30s, became extremely popular, and then by 1840, you had people mass producing banjos because they were the main instrument in the minstrel show. <coughs> and so the next, you know, the next development in the banjo is called the Boucher banjo. Boucher was a, 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 a banjo maker based in Baltimore, Maryland. And this painter, Eastman Johnson, was, was uh, based in Washington, D.C. And so he painted this amazing painting called Negro Life at the South, which is supposed to be a depiction of life uh, in the courtyard behind the house where his family lived on F Street Northwest in, in Washington, D.C. If anybody's ever been to Washington, or if you go to Washington, D.C., F Street is like right in the middle of the city, but back in the day, they, that was uh, more residential, and in the backyard, the back courtyard, the people uh, kept enslaved servants in their house, and this painting is depicting people more or less at their leisure, and I like you can see, this is, the, this is supposedly Johnson's uh, fiance, later his wife, but it was her father that owned the house, and she's sort of peeking out the door and watching what's going on in the backyard. But we're gonna zoom in on the detail there. You can see now, this looks more like a modern banjo. It has this round hoop that was you know, machine made, and uh, five strings. It has one short string on the top, which is a drone. And that's basically how we still see banjos up to the present day. That's my, that's my wrap on the history, taking you up to the point where we see the modern banjo emerge out of the gourd banjo. By the way, they started, before they were machine made, they started off, uh, people used to keep sugar in barrels. And the barrel, the top of the barrel, the cover of the barrel was like a hoop, a, a wooden hoop. And they would just take whatever the cover was off and keep the hoop. And that became the, the, the round part of the banjo. And they you know, continued attaching the neck and actually running the neck all the way through, putting skin on it. 
In later days, you could see uh, plastic for the, for the skin. Instead of animal hide, you would have plastic. And instead of wood, you might see metal for the round part. But the, you know, the, 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 the wooden, wooden hoop banjo began uh, as the cover of a, a barrel that would have contained sugar. Boucher was one of the people that switched over into machine production. So here we are today, the Nemus banjo today. And going back to the horn vassal and sax, the three, the number three tells you that it's a chordophone in their system. You could be a chordophone, you could be an aerophone, which is you, you blow through the instrument and make noise by blowing into it an aerophone. You could be an ideophone, which means the instrument itself makes the noise. And there's, uh, I can't remember now what the other one is. There's something else that you hit. But this is a chordophone, and that tells you that it has strings. The two means that the, that the neck and the resonator are connected, and you can, obviously, we can see that's happening. Uh, the one means that the strings are parallel to the sound table. Sound table is another name for the head. But the strings run parallel to it. You could think, if you want to contrast to that, you could think of the, uh, the West African issue with the kora, which is like a harp, where you have two, you know, two, two columns of uh, strings, 10 on one side, 11 on the other, going up at an angle. And they're not in any way parallel to the, the, the sound table. In the, in the banjo, it's parallel. And you get a, this number one to indicate that. Then the neck is a plain handle. The neck passes through the resonator. I put an asterisk there because if you look at the, and this is the underside of the Nevis banjo, our neck doesn't pass all the way through the resonator. It doesn't go through. It stops at the, it stops at the edge and is at first glued and then screwed in. <coughs> and the two, the resonator is built up from wood. Our banjos are wood. But they're not wood, well, I'm just going to say built up from wood. And then, as I said earlier, it's the last number is 6. It means it's played with a pick. So 321.312.6. By the way, I'm gonna, anybody wants to have a look at this, you can, you can hold it and have a look. We'll pass it around. I'm trusting you. <laughs> when you look at it, turn it over too, you'll see the inside it says made by E. Brandy. So what, what I think some of the, the unique features of the Nevis banjo, because this is the thing, like I've given you this, this you know, historical overview, we kind of know what a banjo looks like, we have the ethnomusicology uh, classification description of it, but this is a very unique instrument. It, it, it is like no other banjo that you're going to find on the planet, it's unique. So some of the things that I see that are unique to the Nevis banjo the first thing is that the resonator is from a tree, okay? It's not from the hoop cover of a, of a, of a sugar barrel. It's not machine made. It's not metal. It's wood from a tree. That to me is fascinating. And I don't know any other place that does it like that. And, and if you don't know, by the way, the tree is either a white cedar or mahogany. The one that's going around is mahogany. The neck, too, carved from a tree. The neck doesn't pass through the body. I mean, even modern banjos, when you turn them around, you'll see there's a pin going through, the, the, you know, going through the resonator all the way to the tail. This one stops at the, at the edge. The peg head inlay. This is, this is I think, only Eugene Brandy makes, makes banjos like this, with this little inlay on it. And I haven't gotten to tell me for sure, but I think that this represents Nevis Peak. If you look at it, it looks like it. It's like the mountain. Kind of like on the flag, you know. It's similar to what you see on the flag. So I think this is, this tells me this is a Nevis banjo because it has Nevis Peak inlaid into the, this is called the peg head. Four strings of the same length. So remember that the, 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 the classic banjo, what you would think of as the modern banjo, has five strings and one of them, the top one, is shorter. It only goes like halfway or two-thirds of the way down the neck, and it's a drone string. This one has four strings. You play all of them. There's not a shorter one or a longer one. They're the same length. And I, and I want to pause here for one second to talk about Alan Lomax, 
who uh, is a very famous collector of uh, ethnomusicology performances, folk music. Alan Lomax kind of invented the practice of collect of recording folk music, and he passed through Nevis in 1962, and he recorded banjo music. And when you go on Lomax's website, which is uh, you can you can look it up at, at culturalequity.org, culturalequity.org. He's a serious uh, folklorist, and so he describes what is in the recordings that he made, and when he refers to the banjo. He refers to it as a five-string banjo. So Lomax, I, I haven't gotten around to it yet, but Lomax, and well, he's, he's deceased, but his, his descendants are still around, and they, they're serious about their website, so I need to get in touch with them. I just let them know that the, the, the banjo that he's recorded in Nevis is actually a four-string banjo. And it has a very unique tuning, and I'll get back to this towards the end. I'm going to actually try to demonstrate a little about the tuning. But the tuning is, is called St. Laura tuning, and if you, if you talk to a banjo player, <clears throat> they'll all refer to St. Laura tuning. Oh, that's that St. Laura tuning. When I got my banjo, which by the way, I got in 2020, 2020 during the pandemic, I was so-called stranded, so to say, stranded in St. Kitts. And uh, my friend, Mrs. Daniel, the librarian at, at Clarence Fitzroy Bryant College, had one of these, I know, I see you had one of these banjos uh, sitting out on a desk in the library. I was like, what is that? I'm a musician, and I, you know, I see this instrument, and I'm like, what is that? She said, that's a Nevis banjo. And I said, how do I get one of those? <laughs> I, want to, I want to play that. So it took a while, but eventually uh, she was able to uh, extract a Nevis banjo from the craft house and from Mr. Brandy. And um, I couldn't figure out how to tune it. Nobody, you know, and, and nobody would really tell me how to tune it. Now, I have some ideas, and to me, it looks kind of like a ukulele. Like a ukulele, four strings, more or less in the same uh, pitch zone. And so I started tuning my banjo like a ukulele, but that was not the correct tuning. And, you know, when I, when I was talking to this guy, uh, Pepper, in the, uh, in the Jingle Bells band in St. Kitts, he said, no, 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 man, it's the St. Laura tuning. And then I would, uh, other people I would talk to, they would also knew how to play banjo and knew how to tune it. They would say, oh yeah, man, that's the St. Laura tuning. <laughs> like, what is that? <laughs> what are the notes? Why do you call it St. Laura? And nobody could answer those questions. <laughs> but I, I'm gonna answer them. I'm gonna at least answer the question of what are the notes a little bit later. But these are some of, to me, the unique features of the Davis banjo. We've shifted now from history to today. I just, you know, I'm not going to read that quote again, but I, I feel like to sort of change the palette from all of the quasi-scientific ethnomusicological analysis of the instrument, we need to remember that it's also a ritual object and that there's a cultural context for the banjo. It's not just this uh, technical object to analyze. So. Nevis banjo today, I want to I want to play a clip now. And this is uh, one that I shot uh, January 11th over in St. Kitts, but it's St. Kitts, it's, it's Nevis musicians from the Advent Minstrels, that's the name of the band. And they went, went over for a funeral service. Are you ready? Let's see if this works. This is Mr. Brandy, that's the banjo maker. 
He also plays Guido in the string band. Catro, 
and the two percussionists in the band. Cultural context, very important to me to understand, you know, how does the banjo actually circulate in life rather than this object that we analyze. How is it, how is it functioning in real life? And I'm grateful to the Advent Mistrals for inviting me over onto that event and letting me film. Okay, so another clip for you, and here I'm going to talk about some other, another thing that I learned was some technical, some technical aspects of how to play the banjo. And this is my friend Babette Williams, who is from Butler's, and uh, this is just the other day.
to buy his banjo as a souvenir. But there's no, you know, there's no banjos for sale. For sale. Where do you go and get one? You got to come over here, and maybe there's one that's just been finished at the craft house. Maybe not. But it would, you know, it seems like there's a market there in the, you know, in the at, at Port Zante and the hotels and what's not for selling the banjo at a, at a higher level. Maybe building a craft house to, to complement the one in Nevis, build a craft, I mean, a craft house operation in St. Kitts. There is a craft house in St. Kitts, but they don't make banjos there. They don't know how. All of this stuff to me also falls under the heading of intangible cultural heritage, ICH, which is a, a category that is recognized and protected by the United Nations Education uh, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO. And there is, there is money, we have, a, we have a, in, in, an ICH specialist here with us uh, running the video camera. And so to me, all of these things uh, around curriculum and around enterprise could fall under the heading of intangible cultural heritage and get some support behind them from not just from UNESCO but other sources. So to me, grant writing to, uh, you know, to, to kickstart this is something that I would be interested in doing. But in all of it, this is my motto, to go slowly and tread lightly, because I know from talking to Eugene, he doesn't really necessarily care about the curriculum. I mean, I, I, he said somebody approached him from St. Kitts, but they only wanted to do the curriculum in St. Kitts. And so he said, I can't really help you, because I would, it, to, uh, this would have to be for Nevis first, and then St. Kitts. And so, you know, curriculum is a, is a, a tricky issue. When you ask where is it going to be developed, and where is it going to be implemented, who's going to receive this curriculum, it's got to be both islands and it's got to be uh, broad based. And then the same thing for, I think, uh, the enterprise issues. He's not necessarily interested in expanding the scale of operations at the craft house. And he always said to me, and it be repeatedly in the last five weeks, it's not about the money, it's about the culture and the history. It's not about the money. And so, to me, you know, I, I see that I'm coming in with these ideas about curriculum and about developing, uh, you know, developing the, the production and the enterprise of the Nevis banjo. But these ideas uh, might not be shared by everybody in Nevis and St. Kitts, and it needs to be it needs to be approached very slowly. And, and somebody like me needs to tread very lightly in, uh, you know announcing plans and developing ideas and all of that kind of stuff, but uh, I have ideas. <laughs> I have them. We just, you know, we have to take it, we have to take it very, you know, very uh, diplomatically, slowly, and tread lightly. And I believe that's all I have to say at this point. Sugar City Music with an understrike, underscore at the end. And I'll, take, I'll take questions if they want. They want to, if anybody wants to ask anything. But you may be exhausted at this point. Any questions? Any questions? It was. A little bit louder. It was a little bit louder than the than the wood. But it sounded good. Yeah, sure, sure. It had, and it was. I should say it was PVC, but it had some. It had some uh, some metal around the outside of the PVC to make it look more like the you know the, the traditional Nevis banjo to make the resonator look more like that wooden head. Uh, but it sounded okay. It really, you know, I was surprised. It actually. Had a little bit more volume than the wooden one. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, like you may have mentioned this, and there was too much excitement going on. <laughs> but, um, it's, it, in the Nevis uh, technique of banjo playing, it looked like it was mostly strumming. Yes. And there was no, there's no picking. I have got that right. Uh, well, there's no like I have never seen yet. I to yet, which is not to say that it doesn't happen. But I've yet to see anybody play leads on the banjo. Yeah. 
And, and I actually took this banjo, I was recording an album with a, in a, a original rock music with a band that I played in, in Orlando. And, I, and we had one song that, that sounded like it needed a banjo, and I took this into the studio. And the lead guitar player and songwriter in the band played a solo on the banjo. And I played it for Eugene, and he was like, that sounds interesting. He liked it, but it, it's, it's, it's very different from the context. So it's one of the and Nita's banjo is strumming all the way, it's but... A, it's a rhythm instrument. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, wait, where did the St. Lara be from? I have yet to... You know? Do you know the answer to St. Lara? Uh, no, so, nobody knows. I mean, that was... I have one slide that I didn't show, like, what, what do I still have to learn? What's yet to be learned on this topic for me is why is it called St. Lara? I don't know, and I, and, and, I mean, it's a, I, I, I did get some insight about this particular tuning is higher than like this. If I was playing a ukulele, the notes on the ukulele are somewhat lower, and the notes on the Nevis banjo are somewhat higher, and, if, and this fits with the, with the guitars in the string band in a nicer way. It's like you can, you know, you, you have a nicer harmony coming with the chords on the, on the banjo with that tuning, with St. Laura tuning, than you would if you had this tuning. So the, the tuning, it sounds nicer to the ear, you know what I mean? The banjo fits better with the guitar, with this tuning. And, but why it's called St. Laura, I have no idea. To me it sounds like a, like a jazz tuning. It's a D major 7 chord if you have, you know, if you're musically trained. That, that tuning is a D major 7 chord. But I don't know who invented it, and I don't know uh, why they call it St. Laura, and I, I hope to find out. And why, why does it have St. Laura? What's that? Why does it have St. You said it was St. Laura, and I don't want to go to the other The other tuning? Yeah. No, I was just, I tuned it exactly like the ukulele. By the way, by the way, another thing I've neglected to mention, when we were in the history part, now we know what this the modern banjo, the, the, the typical one has five strings, one of them short. But there are some banjos that are closer to the Nevis banjo. There's a, something called an Irish banjo or a tenor banjo, and it has four strings, and it's somewhat smaller in scale. And there's another instrument that's called a banjo lele, which is like a hybrid of the banjo and the ukulele, which is why I was tuning this. You know, I thought of this kind of like as a banjo, a banjo lele, and I tuned it like my ukulele. <laughs> but there's only one tuning really for the Nevis banjo, and that is St. Laura tuning. And now you know, now you know what it is. It was a mystery to me for three, three or four years while they're doing this. I see, man. What's let's so I was wondering after all of this. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering what is the future, but you said some of it, but I would like to know, is there any purposeful movement between either yourself or the, um, the conservation society in terms of working with public or private entities to kind of um, solidify the future of the society? Well, that, yes. That to me, we're definitely interested in that. We're just starting the conversation, from my point of view. And then, you know, this talk is a, is like a putting out a shingle, or putting out a you know a, 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 a beacon, saying we're interested in doing this. I could say my interest as a as a, a scholarly type, I want to write a book on the Davis banjo, that would you know make a book contribution. I would like to produce a 52 minute video documentary that would be broadcast on, on TV anywhere, first here, later maybe at PBS in the United States, who knows, where, where uh, for sure recording some more albums of Christmas music, of folk music, and then I think, you know, we could, we could also do stuff like showcases, more showcases, well, here's what I want to say. Another motivation for me, if you go outside of the Nevis banjo and you're just looking at banjo people globally, 
in the United States, in England, in Australia, wherever it might be. Those people are fanatics. They're fanatics. Banjo people are fanatics, but they don't know anything about the Nevis banjo. They've never heard of it. But I think there needs to be dialogue between the banjo fanatics in the United States and elsewhere and the people in Nevis. Nevis is, you know, this is, this is the origin of string music. It's here. It's right here, and it's, it's in that instrument. And the, the banjo people, when they find out about this, they're going to go crazy. They're going to lose their minds. And I see, I see the possibility of a showcase at Culturama, a showcase at Music Fest, where the banjo people from up north come down and meet with, with the banjo people here. And then, uh, you know, in the other direction, we have something called the Smithsonian Folklife Festival that is in Washington, D.C. in the summer. It happens usually right after we have music fests in St. Kitts. The next week, there's the Folklife Festival uh, in, in the Smithsonian. And it's all outside on the mall in Washington, D.C. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm you know, hell-bent on trying to figure out how to get the Nevis string bands into the Folklife Festival. <laughs> great party trip. That would be uh, you know, another way to get the banjo people in the United States in, in, you know, in contact with the, with the Nevis banjo practitioners. And you know, in the United States, when that happened in 1820 and 1830 and 1840, when the minstrel show started, that was white people putting on blackface, playing the banjo, adopting a different form of the banjo than the traditional one, this machine-made banjo that we see as the, as the traditional, I mean, the modern banjo. So there's a way in which the banjo became a white instrument, yeah. and, and you lost the history of the African people that, that invented the instrument yeah. and played it and, and innovated it for 300 years before the rise of the minstrel show and, you know, and, and everything that happened after that and the, the association of the banjo with Southern American white culture. Not to say that that's always a bad thing. There's, there's beautiful music coming out of there, but it's like, what happened to the black people that invented the banjo? Well, that is coming back now. And now in the United States, you have a whole movement called Afro-Latchian. So Appalachia, Appalachia is, is the, mount, you know, the mountains in the south part of the United States where banjo music and country music is coming from. When you think of that real fast picking and flat and scrubs and whatnot, that's Appalachia. But now we have this new category called Afrolatia, where we're reinserting the black banjo players who still, you know, never did, never, never died out, never did not exist, but they're now coming back into the center. And I think that also is a, a you know, a movement in the United States that, is, that, that desperately needs to meet the people from banjo, the, the people from Nevis that play the banjo. And that also, I think, could happen through the, smoke, the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. But the Afro-Latian people have their own gatherings. And so, you know, I know some about that. I'm going to learn more about that and try to figure out how to be a liaison between St. Kitts, Nevis St. Kitts, I'll say, Nevis St. Kitts. And, the, you know, these kind of things that are happening with the Afro-Latian music in the United States. So there's, there's like this, this global aspect to the banjo and, and it's, a, it's, it's a tricky thing because, you know, I'm, I, I see it, and you can tell my enthusiasm for it, but I also feel like, you know, the, the Nevis players, they don't necessarily need to go to the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. You know, everything, is, everything that is needed is right here already. It's right here. So again, it's like, go slowly, tread lightly on that, on that stuff too, but, but I have ideas. I, yes, ma'am. Thanks for listening. You can see them, but they look like this. this and I, and I, I mean, if you're going to go down ethnomusicology lane, the ethnomusicologists have a concept called polygenesis. Polygenesis. Like when, you, when you're looking at an instrument, did this instrument start in this one place and then you know, get evolved, get, get dispersed into other places through diaspora. You know, somebody from Nevis goes to live in Bermuda, 
or somebody, Nevis goes to uh, live in Antigua or Anguilla or wherever it may be, and they take a banjo with them. That's one way. That's, that's, that's dispersal and diaspora and diffusion. But polygenesis would say that possibly people in Anguilla or, you know, wherever had also invented the banjo at the same time. And that to me is a, a, a question mark that I have to answer that. But my, 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 you know, my gut instinct and my reading tells me that the Nevis banjo is the, is the you know, one of a kind. It's Nevis. It's, it started here and... If it's spread, it's spread by people from Nevis taking it to other places. So St. Kitts doesn't have a band of the two bands? Yeah, yeah, they do. I mean, and, and, uh, there's people in St. Kitts that make their own banjos. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interviewing them also. But the impetus for this instrument, I think, is just obviously it's in Nevis. It's here. It's from here. And it's, it's I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's humbling to me to be involved, even having this conversation and to be videotaping people and learning about it because this is, you know, this is big stuff to me, and it's Nevis culture all the way. Yeah, I did want to say also, oh, yes. education for education, I was speaking about the Correct. education system. But I think that progress has been made, because when I was in school, nobody was learning all of these. The children now learn a lot of the culture that forms in school, like the, um, the masquerades and that yes. kind of thing. And they know a lot of that. They, they're not going to play the band, and I know that this interest, which was very developed, I think, in Nevis by the Cultural and the Cultural Development Foundation and the Cultural and so on, have done a lot, I think, to bring some of these art forms back in a strong way that really was then really out. Um, so I think that should be recognized. And also, um, we have we just been going through in the education system a huge curriculum reform localizing curriculum much more and said it's a need to it's just recently um John Mozart I think it came out with the curriculum for school, yeah. right to school. It has a large um, emphasis on local aspects of the curriculum and in social studies and so on there's a lot of emphasis on local culture. And I know they could talk about the local art forms and that kind of thing. I don't think specific focus of input on the band, but I think there's a lot of well, I heard you say social studies. Social studies. So it could be that could be one uh, point of entry for a unit on the banjo into the, the curriculum. Social definitely, and also looking for like if there's local, most of our textbooks are regional. If there's local textbooks at primary level or as you say, writing a book, say for children about the banjo, it would be welcome. Yeah. And it's federal. It's not just needed. It's the same thing. It's federal. The education yeah. department is federal. Yes. So although you have the needed.
a streamline not going as well as it used to. I used to be proud of all streamlines. Very, very proud because these guys were good. Now, this is how that I did. If you were to revive or, or, or make me proud again, where would you start? Well, I think one of the things that... Not, that not, not, not just the, not just the, 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 the banjo, but the stream man fever. Yeah, not because the man. one of the things that I think has to happen for it to move forward, to be revitalized as new songs, new songs, I think you have to be rooted in the, in the folk music, the folk tradition, but you've got to write new songs. And I know Patrick, we were talking before the, the, the event today, he just wrote a song. This to me is one of the things that should make you proud, or you know, is like a starting point for rebuilding pride, is when there are new songs being written. And anything that, that, that people can think of to enhance that process and, and encourage that process, I think that is where that pride is going to come from. That it's not just it's not just we have this tradition that we're you know are, are carrying forward, but we are we are innovating that and we are writing new music in that tradition. That's where I would start. Yeah, because you can give the play instruments, so how are you going to do that? Well, I mean, maybe you have a contest when it's called Jurama time. You have the string bands, but they have to bring a, you have a special contest with a cash prize that is for the best new song. Okay, interesting. But the idea of having new music to me is, is an original, originals, new originals. That's that's pivotal for for revitalizing or you know maintaining forward momentum, however you want to say it, Re rekindling pride, all of that. <laughs>